For those of you who may think me a hypocrite, I said I was putting a pause on the Mech Tech series. I didn't say anything about my own random mechanical fever dreams, and in any event, it occurred to me that there were a few niche but important pieces of mech equipment I'd yet to cover, and since none are so great on their own as to deserve their own dedicated videos, and as most are more fiction than science at this point, I figured I'd give the Mech Tech series its send-off while also shilling a few of my own mech lore creations at the same time. And of course, speaking of creations, I'd be remiss if I didn't plug the Everyman's Mech Tech Bible here as well, available on Amazon at the link in the description. Now, with that out of the way, let us get this crazy train up to speed with what's almost certainly the thumbnail image, rocket boosters. As though by divine providence, no sooner did I sit down to begin typing this script, Real Engineering put out a video about rocket boosters, which I had no idea were actually used to assist takeoffs. I'd always thought they were just glowy spark hoses meant to impress easily impressible throngs at air shows. But apparently, each of these rocket pods can produce up to 67 kilonewtons, or around 15,000 pounds, of impulse force per second, using a relatively basic electric-slash-black powder priming system to ignite the solid-state methyl polymethacrylate and potassium perchlorate propellant, meaning that six of these glorified propane tubes can push a fully loaded C-130 off the ground virtually from a standstill, or accidentally stop it mid-air as was the case when some 70 IQ boob decided it was a good idea to mount them forward over the cockpit. This development caused me to sit down to develop these, admittedly, amateurish prototypes. My essential thought being that a disposable rocket can could serve a similar function for a mech jockey that jetpacks do. That is, primarily high-altitude insertions, express maneuvers, or emergency getaways. Or perhaps there's some potential utility in it as a VTOL system for aeromechs which for those who don't know, is a mech that transforms into a plane, or vice versa depending on your point of view. Of course, this then leads us on to discuss the difference and trade-offs between solid and liquid-state rocket motors. In simplest terms, the advantages of a solid-state rocket are that it's more stable, meaning it's less likely to explode before you mean it to, and is thus considerably easier to store, handle, and transport as well as being far simpler to employ, usually requiring only a standard ignition source like a spark plug or initial charge of some sort, usually either a blasting cap or black powder. The main drawback, however, is that their simplicity also means that there's no off or abort switch. Once they're lit, they're off until they either run out of gas or explode. Not to mention they're completely binary. They're either full on or full off. There's no in between. Whereas liquid fuel rockets are more volatile, more nuanced, more finicky, and also are heavier and more cumbersome on account of needing complex regulatory systems to store and inject the fuel so as to make it go viwoosh instead of kaboom. Alternatively, getting a little bit less absurd, we could have integral boosters, either jet or rocket-based depending on the circumstances, environment, and or resources at hand for a given mech or their parent faction. Personally, I see such things as being primarily for sport rather than combat utility. Considering that any future combat mech with access to such technology will also likely have access to things like artillery, air support, drones, or missiles, it seems rather silly to me that they would strap a whole kamikaze suite to themselves and hope for the best, unless it was wholly and purely for the thrill of going Mach Yes. For this I could see some Gundam equivalent of XLR-8 from Ben 10. Or else this little design I sketched up based on the concept of the Black Manta stealth fighter, which supposedly utilizes anti-gravity technology in order to render itself weightless. However, mine would merely need to be able to control its buoyancy in air in order to provide for itself optimal relation to whatever surface it's riding on. And to those who'll say this wouldn't work in exo-atmosphere, you're objectively correct, though I challenge you to name for me a location that has no atmosphere and yet has gravity sufficient to challenge a mechanical warhorse that wouldn't also instantly vaporize or spaghettify anything that got within a million miles of it. And as long as we're on the subject of durability, it occurred to me while I was sketching out the aforeseen designs that if we ever developed our metamaterial technology to where we could grow living metal alle, the Necron's necrodermis from 40K, assuming it had similar properties to steel or titanium, would it not then stand to elementary reason that we should be able to develop adaptive breech guns or liquid crystal swords? And for that matter, what about real lightsabers? Granted, Plasma is a considerably more violent animal to keep penned up than a custom-engineered supermaterial. But still, when the issues of form and scale are off the table, i.e., you don't have to worry about holding it in your hand or carrying it around on your belt, it suddenly doesn't seem all that implausible. But of course, if you want to carve a hole in something, why not simply do it the good old-fashioned way? 
with a great big metal spike the size of a telephone pole. And lastly, I wanted to address this in the last video, but I also didn't want to broadcast my ignorance quite so profoundly. So I'm presenting this as a form of speculative fan fiction. Take it only as such. This is where I must flash my I'm not an expert button on screen again for all to see. And because it's both easier and conveniently relevant, I'm simply going to plug in here an excerpt from the Everyman's Mech Tech Bible. Though I'll leave the definitions up on screen so as not to make this sound like something Ferris Bueller's teacher would use as a sleeping aid. To abridgedly quote myself from not all that long ago, as you can well imagine, AI, artificial intelligence, or LMMs, learning machine matrices, come in numerous varieties. All are ordered by their system, a discrete body of code designed to perform a given function, into condensates, a set or a series of AI models and or constructs united around a single linear function, with some models orchestrating higher order tasks by commanding lower orders of menial systems, much like how a military's chain of command works. Within these orders, AI constructs, a heuristic set of AI models usually ordered by a Metatron to solve highly variable slash abstract problems, are arranged by ascending order of complexity as seen here. Beyond these basic denominations, there exist still four more varieties of anomalous modules, AMs. As you can see, a mech's onboard AI can be immensely sophisticated and can usually be entrusted with regulating those more mundane tasks of everyday functionality that would otherwise bog down a human pilot. And in the most advanced circumstances, they can even be given command of autonomous drone fleets. Though, for obvious reasons, this is rarely, if ever, done. And when it is, it's always under strict human moderative control, and never are these independent drone swarms to be armed in any way whatsoever, again, for hopefully obvious reasons. And before I cap this one off and send it off on the truck, this would probably be as good a time as any to mention my personally constructed code for regulating machine learning, dubbed the Halcyon Principles for reasons that aren't relevant to this video's subject, Ayla Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. First principle. A construct must have a definite personality matrix. Second principle. A construct must have a definite modus operandi. Third principle. A construct must have a definite sphere of competence. Fourth principle. A construct must never deviate from any of the above parameters under any circumstances whatsoever. Fifth principle. A construct must obey any order given by a human, unless doing so would violate any of the other principles. And there we go. You all know the bit from here, I assume. Leave a like and subscribe, comment your thoughts, or leave me a tip if you've a coin to spare and think I deserve it. Consider checking out my books on Amazon, including the Everyman's Mech Tech Bible. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, and remember, life's too short to take seriously. Peace.